Okay, can everyone hear me okay? Fantastic. How many people are familiar with MariaDB? Some people are, some people are. Okay, uh, we're gonna talk about Clubmer database architecture. I'll be using MariaDB AX as our kind of reference for how we go about that, but I think a lot of the core aspects of it would apply to other Clubmer databases in general. Uh, before we get started, kind of a quick recap of MariaDB. Um, I just want to give a light introduction so we won't spend a great deal of time on it. Uh, the majority of the time will be on the architecture, but for those of you that are um, new to MariaDB or maybe familiar with what we've done in the past, uh, on the next slide, we have MariaDB server is the open source database that hopefully everybody knows and loves. Uh, one of the core aspects of MariaDB server is this concept of purpose-built storage. Um, or more accurately, the ability to use different storage engines for different workloads. Historically, NODB has been our primary storage engine. It is your run-of-the-mill, row-based, B-tree data structure uh, optimized for you know, general read-write transactional workloads, right? even performance between reads and writes. What we ended up doing is they kind of created two different variants, um, MariaDB TX, is an enterprise subscription for customers and it tends to be optimized for transactional workloads. So in addition to NODB, there's other storage engines like MyRox, which came out of Facebook, as well as Spider, uh, which is kind of a distributed storage engine. Uh, the focus for today is gonna be MariaDB AX, so we took that same central MariaDB server, but we gave it a different storage engine to better support analytics. Um, so for those of you that are familiar with MariaDB, that's kind of how it kind of split out is based on workload. If we keep going, um, just to give you a little bit of idea of you know, what we'll do here is I will do a quick introduction, we'll spend the bulk of it on architecture, and then we'll finish off time permitting on some customer use cases and just what people are doing with it in the real world, uh, what kind of challenges they face, what they were looking to solve, um, give you kind of some highlights there. For ReDBX, I'm trying to describe it to people is we wanted a solution for modern data warehousing and analytics. And the question becomes, what does that really mean? Uh, so some of our tenants are that it's distributed, so you can solve that scalability problem and store uh, a lot more data than you traditionally might expect to. Uh, it has to be MPP and use parallel processing to give you better performance. So if we're looking at a system that's gonna let you analyze you know, 100 terabytes and 100 billion rows of data, we're gonna need distributed storage and MPP to be able to do that in real time. Uh, more importantly, we had to have a way to get data efficiently into MariaDB AX. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, and finally, because we're MariaDB, it has to be open source. So I think columnar databases aren't necessarily a new thing. Um, certainly data warehouses aren't a new thing, but there hasn't been a whole lot of open source alternatives in that space for a long time. Uh, so that's kind of a key tenet of what we're trying to do, is we're trying to solve a problem that's typically been in the land of proprietary databases and giving an enterprise open source alternative to those. Uh, and finally, standard SQL. So especially for those of you that are familiar with MariaDB, the same SQL that you're doing for transactional applications is the exact same syntax you can use for analytical. Uh, we're not gonna take things away and say that in order to do all this, we can't do joins anymore. We could still do joins. Um, in order to do all this, we can't do aggregation anymore. We can still do aggregation. So no limitations um, from standard SQL. So we'll get a little bit into the architecture here. Um, as I said before, you know, NODB is our default storage engine. Um, and I just whipped up a, a simple table here. It's gonna store the data by row in its entirety. So in some ways, I would think of it as one file and every row just gets appended to that file. I'm oversimplifying, of course, but conceptually, Let's think of it that way. And if we do a query on it, uh, let's say that we wanted to do an average uh, of the spend here. The real problem with that query is that you're gonna end up reading all of the data that's in that table. So every single row is gonna be read from disk. So in a sense, you're reading your entire data set off of disk to do that type of aggregation. It's really inefficient because at the end of the day, all you really wanted was to average the spend. So why are you reading customer month and year from disk? Right, that, that's terribly inefficient. So what we did is we added a new storage engine into MariaDB server, it's kind of that dotted line up there. So that's kind of our storage engine interface. But the storage in and of itself is pulled out 
and ran in a separate process. And that's the one down here. So that's column store. And the big difference is we're gonna store data by column. So conceptually speaking, think of each of these columns as being stored in their own file. And so if we were to do that query again and say select, you know, and get this average of all spend, the only thing it's reading from disk is now this spend column. So from a pure I.O. perspective, if you have a billion rows in your database and someone wanted to come in to do some analytics and they're doing some sort of aggregation uh, on one of those columns or maybe a handful of those columns, you can think about the I.O. efficiency and instead of reading your entire data set from disk, you're reading a sliver of it. Uh, we have users with tables with two, three hundred columns in it. At any point in time, they're querying three or four columns, you know, different for each query. Much more efficient if we can move to a columnar. Uh, the other benefits of, is high compression. Uh, you can get upwards of 65, 95% is what we see in the real world. Uh, one of the ways I would do it simply is that whatever your raw data is before it's in the database, it'll be stored on disk in about a tenth of the size. Uh, so if you had you know, a terabyte of data, it comes down to you know, 100 gigs. If you had 10 terabytes of data, it's probably gonna be about a terabyte stored on disk. Uh, and that has a lot to do with being stored as columns. The other two things kind of go hand in hand there around the spare columns, uh, the nulls and the many columns, is that you are free to construct tables with hundreds of columns. And some of them might be null, some of them might be empty, uh, some of them may or may not be equal to each row. But the idea is that if you want to, you can create one big table with hundreds of columns and many, many billions of rows. Um, you could alternately go a star snowflake schema route. There's nothing that prohibits you from doing that. But from a pure efficiency point of view, if you can get to a big table, then you're going to get a lot of performance out of it. And finally, a really big one is that you don't have to have indexes anymore. So from an analytical point of view, what we found is that it's one thing to have a BI reporting database where you have um, a small, fixed, known set of queries. Then a DBA can come in and basically optimize that database for those queries through indexes, through partitioning, different storage, right? All the bells and whistles are there to make sure that those handful of queries run really, really well. But when you get into more analytical workloads, we find that people are doing a different query every time, right? They're exploring, it's interactive, it's ad hoc, it's iterative. They never know what the query is gonna be, so they can't really optimize it to begin with. Um, they need a database that'll allow them to query the data any way they want, whenever they want, however they want. And that's one of the other benefits you get from columnar databases is that you traditionally don't need indexes anymore to get that performance. The other part too for me is that indexes are a little bit less necessary in the analytical workloads that this is optimized for because this isn't intended to do you know, point and range queries, right? It isn't look up my last five purchases or look up my customer profile. It is really intended to analyze most, if not all, of your data. Give me the average purchase price for every financial transaction in the last 20 years. If I'm a bank, that's a massive amount of data. Um, I don't need indexes to narrow it down to three or four records. I'm literally analyzing billions of records. So the other part, and this will get a little bit into implementation, is that what we start to do is we take a column and we consider a column segment. And that segment is comprised of something that we call extents. And those extents are comprised of eight million rows. So if I were looking at this spend column, this is more or less a file. Um, it's broken up to segments. Every eight million values in this column comprise an extent. And a whole bunch of extents comprise a segment. And a handful of segments can comprise a file. So it's kind of logically and conceptually broken up into manageable pieces. And so the reason I wanted to tell you a little bit about that is one of the things that we can do is for each of those extents or each of those groupings of eight million values, we will track the min value found in there and the max value found in there. Uh, so if you're familiar with the concept of table elimination, this is very similar to that. If you do a query, for example, on the left side there, uh, if they're trying to find something between 220 and 250, we could use those min max values to identify where the value might exist. Right? It doesn't guarantee it's there, but if I look at extents one, two, and four, based on their ranges, I know it can't possibly be in there. So I'm not even gonna read those from disk, it's not worth it. If anything, I'll try extent three and see if it's in there. Or conversely, in the other example, based on those ranges, I know the data isn't anywhere to be found. So there's no bother in trying to get it. 
Now, from a terminology perspective, that upper part, that MariaDB server interface, this is where your queries come in. This has got the SQL parser, optimizer, executor, et cetera, et cetera. We call that a user module. The bottom piece where the actual storage is and where most of the processing happens, we call that a performance module. When you're first getting started, if you're running this on your laptop, you could run the user module and the performance module together on the same instance. Or if it's a container or AWS instance, whatever it might be, um, you can consider them one unit and you can install them together. But as you start to go forward a little bit more, I talked in the beginning about being distributed. Uh, so on the previous slide, we might have had, I know it's small, but say there's 300,000 rows. If you needed better performance, then you could split that storage across three different PMs. And there's an advantage of that in that now you can take your query, you break it down into tasks, you send it to each of those three M's to be executed in parallel, and then you aggregate those results and you give them back to the user. So by breaking things down into smaller tasks and executing more of them in parallel, you're gonna get better performance. The other aspect of it is it's not just a query that gets broken down into three tasks based on this example of having three PMs. It's also engineered for multi-core processors. So a task might come into that user module and say, hey, I have some data on this PM. I'd like to send the query process in here. It won't just send one task. Based on how many cores are on here, it'll send a whole bunch of tasks. So you can think that instead of executing you know, a read on that entire file in that column, if there's a whole bunch of extents and we have a whole bunch of cores, we can have each of those threads running on a separate extent in parallel. So we basically break it down even further into many threads. On top of that, you can also scale out the upper part too. So the bottom part, when we're talking about storage and processing, is for two things. One, you just have a really big data set. So if your data isn't gonna fit on a single disk, then just add as many performance modules as you need until you can store all of your data. Two, if your queries need to be faster, add more of these. The more parallelization you get and the smaller the jobs, the faster your queries are gonna be. On the upper part would be more about concurrency. So if you have more users issuing queries, um, you know, on one hand, let's say it's an internal thing. You have a very small data science team, a handful of people doing some pretty intensive queries. One user module is probably fine to suffice them. If you were building an application that's public facing to all your customers and giving them the ability to do analytics, you might need more user modules to support more users and more concurrent queries. Uh, but it's up to you. You can scale both of those tiers independently of each other. So even though I'm doing three and three, you might have two, P two UMs for high availability in just case one fails over or because you have a little bit of concurrency and you might have eight performance modules depending on how big your data set was. So the next part comes into how you get data in. So with ReDB AX, you can put data in through SQL. So I know that some analytical environments tend to be read only. You can send in inserts, updates, and deletes to do incremental changes to whatever the data set is you're trying to analyze. But in the end, SQL isn't exactly the most efficient way to get data into a database. It's great to get it out of a database. Not so good to put it into a database, especially if you have a lot. Um, think about you know, if you're inserting a million rows throughout the day, um, one million transactions is not exactly gonna be super fast. But nonetheless, you can use SQL to put data in. There are a few more options though. One of them is through an import tool. So there's a command line interface that says if you have a file, for example, a CSV file, that tool can break up that CSV file into a handful of paces and write them directly to the storage notes. So this is much, much faster. So you bypass the SQL parser and the SQL face entirely, and you just take subsets of that file and you put them each right on the underlying storage. It's kind of like your fast highway right into the database. Uh, if you wanted to do it even faster, you could potentially um, partition those files yourselves and then run them on the PM node. So in the previous slide, you have the UM. That's kind of a centralized point where you can insert that data to all the PMs, but if performance is super, super critical to you and you can actually put those files on each of the PMs directly, then you don't even have to send the data over the network anymore. It just goes straight from a CSV file on disk into the storage system on disk. So fairly quick for bulk loading data. The other one that we rolled out in a more recent release was this notion of bulk data adapters. 
So we had customers using the CLI tool to do imports, but it becomes a little bit finicky because they're setting up cron jobs. Maybe they run once a day or once a week. Uh, somebody's responsible for getting that file, placing it on a system somewhere, um, praying that the cron job sees that the file has been added, actually runs when it's supposed to. More importantly, that it doesn't break, because if it does break or it does get stuck, nobody knows. Right? We're just kind of hoping in the background that it's happening. And so the data adapters came back about because we wanted to give developers, you know, admins, data scientists, whoever it is, the ability to do your own applications and your own scripts to get data into the storage system. So you don't necessarily have to go through an import tool. You could write a REST service in Java that collects quickstream data and pumps it in here for analytics. Or if you're doing data science and whatever your favorite Python library of choice is, you can use the Python bulk data adapter to publish the raw results directly into the underlying storage. So it just gives you a little bit more control, a little bit more flexibility in how you want to get data into the database. And there's also a Spark connector. I talked to a few people about it today. So if you're doing machine learning in Spark and you need somewhere to put those results so that other people can interact with it and explore with it, there's an adapter for that as well. So when your Spark job looks to write out the data, writes it directly to the storage. Oh, that's right. Uh, finally, I don't have a dedicated slide for it, is the streaming data adapters. So if you have Kafka set up, uh, there is a process that can connect to multiple Kafka topics, retrieve those messages, and write those directly to storage as well. And then the last one is max scale CDC. So if you remember way back at the beginning, I said that MariaDB kind of went in two different directions right now. MariaDB TX for transactional and MariaDB AX for analytical. Within that MariaDB TX package is something called MariaDB max scale. And that is a database proxy. One of the key functions of that database proxy is change data capture. So that proxy can stream database changes to any external system as they're happening. And so we put a consumer for that in ReadyBX. So if you put them both up together in an environment, as people are you know, working on your website, shopping, buying, all that transactional data is being collected, it's automatically being streamed over into your analytical environment so that you have access to near real-time data. Whatever that delay might be, seconds, minutes, you might be behind a little bit. It depends on how long it's taking to stream that data over. But the idea being that it's automatic, it's continuous, it's transparent. If you have people doing analytics, they don't have to worry about doing bulk imports or batch jobs. They always have access to almost real-time data. And so I'll spend a, a few more minutes on customer use cases, and hopefully we'll save some time for Q&A. Uh, one of them is in financial services, and it's funny because I had some conversations with, Tay, with people that were um, in similar regards. Uh, I'll start with the one in the middle because it's actually the simplest, is archiving. So depending on your industry, some industries will require you to store data for five years, six years, seven years, potentially more. Uh, if you're looking at you know, a traditional uh, relational database, it might be difficult to scale to that data set size. Right? So it's one thing to have a year of data uh, it's another thing to store 100 terabytes uh, for 10 years of data. So sometimes it's just a scalability issue. Um, other times it comes down to analyzing those transactions. You know, even if it's your debit card or credit card purchases, trying to find are there anomalies, are there behaviors. Um, I discovered a few years ago when I had a fraudulent activity on my card that apparently the bank knew my behavior based on my location, that 90% of my charges occurred within one mile of where I lived because I lived in a city. And this purchase was like three miles out of the city. Um, but yeah, it's amazing what they can learn through that. And in this case, uh, OTC Markets Group was a really great example. Um, they were accumulating about 10 terabytes of rolling data. Um, so at the time, I forget the exact amount, but it was a much less than five years. Um, they had compliance issues that required them to move to five years of rolling data. That was 10 terabytes. Now, 10 terabytes isn't the biggest data set I've seen before. But for most open source relational databases that are not distributed, 10 terabytes is actually a lot. Um, if you're in a MySQL or a MariaDB environment, getting that to perform really well with analytics at 10 terabytes is pretty challenging. Um, you're going to optimize it. You're going to optimize it a lot. Uh, and part of what they had is they wanted their customers to be able to do analytics on those 24 million quotes and all those trades. Uh, so their customers can come in and analyze it any way they want, whenever they want to. Uh, more to the point, Regulators had to be able to come in and also query and analyze the data whenever they wanted to, however they wanted to. So if you remember back at the beginning, I said that one of the challenges is you can't necessarily optimize 
a traditional data warehouse for any possible query that's unforeseen and unexpected. But when you can do away with indexes, and you can rely on a few architectural um, tricks here and there, you can allow people to do that. The other one is healthcare. Um, and this is a really neat one, but I'm gonna focus more on population health management. Uh, we have customers who are storing patient surveys. So I think this was within, I wanna say Medicaid, Medicaid, Medicare, uh, but people who are part of those programs, they take out surveys, they do surveys every single year. And so what they're trying to do is, can I look at how a general population is answering these surveys to some, to some conclusion about their health, um, maybe even by geography? Or for a particular person, can I see how their answers have changed over time based on the treatment and programs they've been in to figure out are they effective? And if they're not, should I recommend a new program or new wellness program for them? Um, so there's kind of correlation not only within an application because depending on how you answer a question, it might spawn a new set of questions, but there's correlation over time. And so in this particular example, I'll go to the next one. Uh, this is a really great one. This was IHME, uh, Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation. This is a nonprofit organization that is studying the global you know, world health population, uh, ultimately with the goal of being able to provide recommendations and input to governments and other agencies on how to improve it. The challenge they had is they were using MySQL and they very quickly outgrew it. So this um, global burden of disease, the actual name of the project, the very first one they did was a little bit on the smaller side. I wanna say it was probably in the hundreds of gigabytes maybe and then they were doing it, I think every two years, and their scope kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, they soon realized they were beyond uh, a terabyte and beyond a handful of terabytes, and MySQL wasn't really in a position to meet their requirements anymore. And so they ended up moving to AX to get more scalability and to be able to store more data. Today, there are about 30 terabytes of compressed data. Um, so they actually start out with petabytes of raw data, and then it goes through a whole bunch of processing, and it basically outputs um, I forget the uncompressed size, but a more manageable structured data set that you can do analytics on. It is actually 10 tables, each table with 10 billion rows. And what they want to do is they want to be able to give you and I the ability to analyze that data in real time. And so if we go on the next slide, uh, there might be a link in this deck if you guys get it later, or if you Google IHME, you can probably find it. Uh, but this is a public facing website that lets you analyze those 100 billion data points on world population health, you can change the options and the sliders in real time and the visualization updates in real time. So if anyone wants to actually see ReadyBAX in action, that's a really good way to do it because that's what they're using to let you analyze that data. Telecommunications is another big one. Uh, I think the one that's probably most interesting to me is the network optimization, um, but also call detail records as well. That came up in a, a conversation earlier this afternoon but being able to store all the data related to the network traffic, uh, where the cell towers are, how much traffic is going through, because what they're really trying to figure out is, where do I invest? Where do I need to build new towers? Or where do I need to reinforce existing towers? How is traffic gonna change depending on the Super Bowl or some world groundbreaking event? What are things that impact it? How can I optimize my network to lower the cost, but at the same time provide the service necessary to support the demand? And so the example for this one is Pinger. Um, I don't know if anyone's familiar with Pinger, but they do text and chat mobile apps. Uh, they do about 30 million texts, I think this is a day, uh, 3 million phone calls and about 1.5 billion logs a day. Um, they were also in a bind, and I believe they were also in a MySQL environment, and that they were able to scale to about six months of data. Uh, the problem is that they had a whole um, data science team, and they were looking to analyze customer behavior. So how are their users using these apps? You know, what, when do they use them? How do they use them? Who are they using them with? They're just trying to get more awareness of their customers, but you can't do that with only six months of data. It's just not enough of a working data set. And so their next goal was we want to get to two years of historical data for all of our customers and then be able to analyze that data. So that was another example where it came down to a scalability perspective that in order to support a data set, of this size where you're gathering 1.5 billion logs a day and you want two years of those, you have to scale out fairly well to support that. Digital advertising, another one, and this is for ad tech, um, for me and basically you know, some of the experience I have in my background. 
I would say audience segmentation is kind of the more interesting one for me, or probably the more common one. And the idea being that, I mean, we're all on the internet all day, we see the ads all day. For those advertisers, what they really want to do is personalize that ad, which means they need to get very granular. So they're taking data about you, you know, are you male, are you female, what's your age, where do you live, what are your interests, what are your hobbies, what do you like to search for, what websites do you visit. They want to collect massive amounts of clickstream data on your behavior and your usage on the internet. They want to use that data to create a very specific profile that encompasses you and people very similar to you. Uh, so the chances are that if they serve an ad based on all that, hopefully you click it and they're making money on it. Uh, but that's again a kind of another scalability issue because it's not just a handful of data that defines you. They're literally ingesting hundreds of billions of clickstream events on users and then using that to create those profiles. And so the example for this one, um, I couldn't go into who actually is doing it. Their initial POC was doing 300 million impressions a month, uh, about 70 million rows, I think that was a day, uh, and 60 terabytes of uncompressed data. That was during the POC for a small sliver of their traffic. I think today it's actually several orders of magnitude bigger than that. Uh, but kind of a, a, a similar challenge for them that their big one was um, they have this ad tech platform, right, that they provide their customers use. And think of it as a SaaS. And they wanted their customers to be able to go in and analyze uh, the performance of their ads. So all that clickstream data, the impressions, the clicks, conversions, um, their customers should be able to analyze that. And what they provide to their customers is you can choose any subset of 30 columns to run your query. Um, but that's about it. I mean, every customer might do a completely different subset of those 30 columns. They might do radically different queries. So it's another environment where, from a management perspective, there's no way he was going to be able to create an index for every possible query. There's no way he's going to be able to manage a system that could be used by all of his customers, each in a different and unique way. And so moving to a columnar database, not having to create indexes, and being able to support you know, large-scale aggregation on hundreds and hundreds of millions and billions of events gave them that flexibility to service their customers. So hopefully that was a whole bunch of information, not, not terribly long, but happy to answer any questions. So for IHME uh, and their visualization interface, it more or less goes directly to the database. I mean, they might have services or something that's servicing the web interface, but the data itself, you know, it starts out as that raw data, so they have a giant storage array and all kinds of, you know, big data tools, if you will. They crunch that petabytes down into, you know, that 30, 40, 50 terabytes of more structured usable data and then that's served directly from that website. Um, other people sometimes, depending on their data set, might have a huge you know, data lake uh, with Hadoop. And then if they're doing you know, more real-time analytics, they'll carve out whatever subset is relevant and they'll move that into MediaBX and then let people use the tools of their choice to interact with it and query it and analyze it. Uh, but as far as the, the Q part, yeah, some people prefer to use Kafka so they'll just collect the data there, and then they'll just pull it into MariaDBx automatically. Um, or they're building applications in the beginning, as I mentioned, with those bulk data adapters. So whether it's Python or Java, uh, people can build their own tools and services to collect data and write that into the storage system. But as far as a middle part, as in you know some truth, and then a data mart, and then MariaDBx, it's usually not like that. Um, either MariaDBx is the source of truth, or maybe it's a data lake or something that's a source of truth, and a subset's being pushed out. Yeah. Ho hopefully that helps. Let me know if I'm not quite there. Any other questions? Is there a single sorter for all the different columns? Like, is it a share the same sorter? Or do you have to choose your own sort key? Um, I don't think you choose. I don't think you choose your own sort key, so they're basically sorted by insertion rate uh, and probably by primary key. I'd have to double check. Uh, but I don't think each column is sorted differently. So it's still kind of sorted by row, per se, and based on insertion. It's just partition vertically. Okay. 
So ReadyB really provides that interactive access to other people. So uh, my background isn't necessarily in Spark, but from my experiences with it, Spark doesn't necessarily store data and serve it, right? So you can do work on it in Spark, but you still need to ultimately put it somewhere where other people can have access to it, and that's ultimately what people do with Spark and ReadyBX. So it's not for every use case, but for some folks, it, think of it as result publishing. So they're doing whatever dark arts they're doing with machine learning and Spark, and then they put that over somewhere else where other people can actually get at it through SQL, whether it's Tableau or their own custom front end or whatever it might be. Yeah, but it, it doesn't compete with Spark in the sense that it does machine learning itself, right? There's still an assumption that you're using something else to do machine learning, for example. Yeah. Other questions? Max scale CDC? Uh, max scale CDC is essentially, um, so you have your database instance and that proxy is kind of sitting above it and it's kind of aware of what's happening. And then that proxy instance can accept connections from an external client and basically let that client pull a stream of changes to it. Um, but it's not necessarily ETL and that changes the format from one to the other. So even though it starts out as row based, Yes, it will end up column-based, but it won't change the columns or the structure or something like that. You might have to use an Informatica or some other ETL tool if you wanted to do that. Can it work both directions? If I change something in the analytics database, can I have that pull up and then end up in the other? That's a good question. I'd have to check on that. I haven't thought about that one yet. Is that associated with the uh, Linux? Excuse me? Oh no, that's part of it. That's part of ReadyB. Yeah, yeah. No, yeah. When you, yeah, subscriptions include both the database as well as that database proxy. Um, the database proxy does come with ReadyB AX as well, so you you basically get it with either one. Most of the time, you just kind of have one proxy set up, but it might be possible. I'd, I'd have to ask and, and verify though. That's a good question. Other questions? Did I miss anything? All right. Thank you, everyone. Could go to the app uh, and give a feedback for this talk. We will